So welcome everybody to the last webinar or the last technical Tuesday uh, in English of 2020. It's been a tumultuous year to say the least. And um, so today what we're going to quickly run through is a, a little bit of detail on how we train our Chipmaster engineers on how to uh, quickly and easily identify and solve the most common faults on our incubators. So the faults that we're going to run through today, some of the most common ones, as I said, are faults on the heating systems on our single stage and multi-stage incubators. Um, uh, damper operating failures, turning failures, and then should we have time at the end, I'll spend a little, little bit of time as well on probe failures. Now, for each of these faults, what we're going to run through is how you're likely to encounter the fault. So the sort of the telltale signs of things to look out for that would tell you that something's wrong and best practices that you can put in place in your hatchery in order to identify these before they impact on your hatchability and your chick production how to quickly identify the cause of the fault. Uh, so what the root cause of that is as quickly as possible. And then obviously how to get that, that fault fixed and get the incubator back running again as quickly and as safely as possible and as, as cost effectively as possible as well. So a couple of ground rules going into general maintenance on any incubators. And these are things that are best practice for any hatchery in the world, no matter where you are and what, whatever the local rules are. But obviously, if you're going to go into depth on, on local regulations, you have to adhere to any, any local laws and ordinance as well. So maintenance by and large is split between two main categories. You've got your preventative maintenance, so things like swapping out your belts before they snap, keeping on top of corrosion on your machines and swapping out relays before the end of their natural life. And then you've got reactive maintenance, which is what we're going to spend a lot of a, a lot of today's time on. So now reactive by its very nature is something that you don't get to prepare for. It, it usually pops up at the worst possible time. Um, but there is, however, some planning that you can do. So if you accept the fact that it's reactive and then prepare yourself for it, it can put you in a much better stead in order to correct those issues on the incubator. First thing you've got to bear in mind is safety. If you're going to uh, work on an incubator, it's important to realize that there's a live electricity, there's potentially high pressure pneumatic systems, there's hot water um, and hot electric heating elements and also moving mechanical parts as well. So any of those faults any of those hazards should be isolated before you start working on the incubator and if you're not confident in your own skills on those areas then we highly recommend getting in outside expertise or even phone chipmaster for help on those first thing everybody should have for all of their equipment on site not just their incubators but hvac and third-party equipment as well as documentation I'm going to be touching on a lot of information today, but I'm not going to be going into specifics of which outputs and which uh, wire colors for each individual control, purely because of the huge back history of different incubators and different controls that Chickmaster has out in the field. Uh, so rather than going skin deep um, on everything and missing out a lot of information, I'm going to be perfectly upfront with you that uh, in a best case scenario, you need to have this documentation on site ready for you. So should you need it, it's there to hand. Next thing you're obviously going to need is the correct tools. Um, any jobs far easier if you've got the correct tools, but for the basic troubleshooting, the things you're going to require are a multimeter, a set of screwdrivers, and a set of spare cables and probes. And the very last thing you're going to need is a well-stocked spare parts cabinet. There's no point identifying a faulty component if you haven't got something that you can replace it with or a known good component that you can swap out and test with. Last of all, you want to give yourself some time. Whether you're a single stage or multi-stage, there's always a step that you can take in order to give yourself a little bit more time so that you're not rushing, so you're not as rushed in order to fix the incubator. So if you're a, a classic hatchery, you can always move, move eggs into another, either onto farm trolleys and then into the corridors of other incubators. Or if you're in a single stage facility and you're fortunate enough to have a spare machine, that's an option. Or you can move, move setter eggs early into hatches just for a short period of time in order to maintain temperatures. So the first fault that we're going to touch on today is a heating system failure. So in these in instances, it's somebody in the hatchery coming to the maintenance staff or to the hatchery manager, whoever's in charge of maintenance for the incubators, and making you aware that there is a, a heating system failure on one of your incubators. So it's either setters or your hatches. So what are you going to see and when you're going to see it? In an ideal world, all of your faults would be spotted before it impacts your incubation cycle. So before it has a, an impact on your hatchability or your chick quality. Ideally, we'd see this during a preset checklist. 
So preset checklists are something I try and bring up in every single Tech Tuesday that we do. The reason we recommend them highly in Chipmaster is it gives you the opportunity before eggs go into an incubator in order to verify that every mechanical function on that machine is working as intended. Once that preset checklist is ticked off, so and this is just going through the brief um, technical functions of the machine, that machine is then handed back over to operation. So second most common way you're going to spot an error on the function of an incubator is a reviewing of the maestro data. Now this is second on the list because you can do this during the incubation cycle, but nine times out of 10, the Maestro information is seen retroactively once you're already aware of a chip quality problem, which is the third one. So a heating fault or heating, uh, uh, yeah, heating fault on the machine is most likely to in inhibit itself on the chicks, either with a chip quality or your hatch window issue. So when I say hatch window issue, I mean, it's gonna lengthen the time of your hatch window due to a reduction in uniformity within that cabinet. So your preset checklist. So this is the machine's been washed down. It's been emptied of eggs. They've been transferred or they've been pulled in case of a hatcher. It's been washed down and then your staff come along and they run through the maintenance checks for the machine. These maintenance checks, these preset checklists should be carried out regularly. So for a single stage machine, you wanna be doing that every single set. And for a multi-stage, you, sh you should be looking to do these sorts of checks once a month. Now this is a basic mechanical function check. So you're going in and you're enabling the heating system from the test menu, which is available on all of our incubators. And what you're looking for is to double check that all of the heating elements in that machine get up to temperature as expected. Now on our Evita machines, so our single stage machines, you've got four heating elements per zone arrayed in the center of the machine. And for the multi-stage machines, even the Buckeye and the Classic, you've got these 1200 watt heaters that are mounted on the fan boards down through the center of the machine. Checking them can be as simple as putting the backs of your hands close to the heating element, but it's highly recommended that you use sort of a handheld infrared camera just to verify that it's getting up to those correct temperatures. As well as a mechanical check to make sure they're getting up to temperature, you also wanna check the overall condition of those heating elements. So you wanna be checking for signs of water ingress and corrosion, cracks or just brackets that are coming loose on those elements. Degradation in them in general can lead to failure further down the line, and it's far better to spot that whilst you have this opportunity in the machine empty, rather than once it's impacting your hatch quality. Whilst you're doing these checks, it's also a great time to do preventative maintenance on that machine. So as I said, if you do find a fault inside the incubator, you can rectify it before it has a, a negative impact. The reviewing of the Maestro data, the sort of things that you're looking for are zones that are lagging behind. So if you've got a heating element or a heating a zone that's not heating correctly, you're going to find that it A gets up to temperature slower than the other, other zones inside the machine or the other machines within the hatchery. And if you have a fault during the incubation cycle, you're going to find that that individual zone is having to heat a lot more than the neighboring zones in order to maintain temperature, especially in those early stages of incubation when the egg's endothermic and requires heat input from the control side. Now we did spend quite a bit of time reviewing Maestro data in one of our earlier webinars, and I highly recommend anybody that wants a bit more information on that, go to webinars on demand on our website where there's a recording of that webinar for you. Now, when it comes to chick quality, if your temperature control, your temperature regulation inside the incubator isn't uniform from front to back and in, in, within individual zones, what you're gonna find is your temperature uniformity has a direct impact on the hatch window. So as normally you might expect a hatch window of around 12 hours in your incubator, if that's suddenly elongated and it's, it's stretched out to 18 to 20 hours, that's a pretty good indicator that something's gone um, abnormal on your temperature control inside that cabinet. And that, that should be the, the absolute last sign to pull that incubator apart and try and find that fault. Now there's a chance if you're not doing regular checks in the hatchery that this information comes back from the farms. Um, in those cases, it's gonna be due to stressed chicks or potentially dehydrated chicks for, in the case of the ones that are coming off a little bit earlier. Um, and the net result of that is a, a slight spike in your seven to 10 day mortality. So it's important to talk to everybody that's involved in the hatchery all the way down to the farm to make sure that the chicks that you're supplying are of absolute top quality. How do you identify the fault? So from the point of view of the maintenance guy stood in front of the machine, he, all he's been told going into this is that there is a fault with the heating system on this incubator. So the first thing we're going to want you to do is to go into the test mode for your screen and enable that heating system. So on a Gen 4 monochrome, 
a Gen 4 color touchscreen or a rock screen, the functionality is there in order to just force the heating in each individual zone. And then you want to check to see how many of the heating elements per zone are physically getting hot. Now, the reason we do this is knowing how many heating elements are, are getting up to temperature is a great way of narrowing down the fault on the incubator as to whether it's a zonal issue of fault with a specific heating element or a machine wide fault. So it allows you to target your troubleshooting straight away. So if none of your heating elements are getting warm, the first thing we're going to do is start checking the PLC output. Is that are those PLC outputs active? So on a Gen 3 control, you've got little LED lights arrayed across the top. And on a Gen 4 control, your digital outputs on are the are those bottom array of lights on the on this PLC here. So are they physically active and supplying 24 volts to the solid state relay? So the solid state relay you can see here, it should be receiving 24 volts to the top of that relay. If it is receiving 24 volts, the green indicator light will come on and it'll then supply the 230 volts or 110 volts out to the heating elements. So if purely in this point, we're checking the top of that solid state relay for the 24 volts. If we're not getting it, it allows us to focus our attention onto the power supply. So do we have a clean 24 volts coming off the power supply? If we do, we know the fault is therefore from the PLC or the PLC output. So on a Gen 4 control, we're going to pull out our memory cassette. We're going to reload that PLC just to rule out any corrupt data areas and recheck the system. If that doesn't work, we're going to replace the PLC. And in some rare cases on Gen 3 controls, you'd have an additional digital output card. So you'd have to replace that. Now, if the power supply isn't supplying a clean 24 volts, Two options. The first is to uh, manually adjust the output of the power supply. So usually on the power supplies that we supply, there is a small dip switch on the front, which you can tweak to modulate the output. So as the power supply degrades over time, you're going to see a gradual reduction in the output voltage, and that allows you just to tweak it back up to 24 volts. Failing that, you want to replace the power supply. And on a rock control, you've got dual power supplies, one that supplies the fuel devices and one that supplies the devices, the relays inside the cabinet. If the PLC output is supplying 24 volts to the solid state relay, we wanna be looking at the secondary side of that solid state in order to check that it's got 220 volts or 230 or 110 volts going out to the heating elements. If it doesn't, we're down to checking the breakers. A, make sure it's on. B, check the wiring to make sure there's no loose connections there. And, to, and then thirdly, to make sure that you've got a clean 230 volt supply. If you don't, you wanna be looking to replace the breaker. And if you do, you wanna be replacing the solid state relay. So very easily within five steps, you've narrowed down the fault on this incubator to exactly what it is. So you've identified the problem and you're able to replace it. Now, if your solid state relay does have output, so it is putting out a clean 230 volts or 110 volts, but your heating elements aren't getting hot, none of them, you wanna check each heating element and its wiring. Now the heating elements on an individual zone on our incubator is all wired up in parallel. So it's exceedingly unlikely that one heating element going down will impact the rest of them functioning. However, if you've got a short on the system, what you can find is that breaker repeatedly tripping. If you get to this stage of the, of the fault finding, it's worth swapping out individual heating elements just to rule, out them, rule them out one by one. Now back to the test mode, if all except one heating element heats up, obviously you can rule out a large portion of this decision tree because you know that the control's working, you know the solid state's working, and you can go straight to um, diagnosing the individual heating elements. Now the table at the bottom of this page is really handy as a reference material and it shows you the expected current draw for each of our heating elements and the resistance that we'd normally expect. Now, these are going to vary slightly based on your local voltage to the hatchery, but it's well worth documenting these for specifically for your site so you know what you're looking for on a known good heating element. And that's what all of this is based on, is, is comparing a known good to what you're seeing on site. Now, if when you're in the test mode, all of your heating elements function as expected, but you still are aware that there is a fault on the heating system on your incubator, then we come to a second tree. 
And these are, this is the order that we get our engineers to check the heating systems or the heating control systems on an incubator, uh, because these are usually the, from the left to the right, the most common faults to the least common faults. So straight away, we're gonna get that customer or our engineer to check the calibration of the machine. Is it physically correct? So we'd run through for a good hour or so just to verify that the temperature probes are reading accurately. The reason for this is if you've got one zone that's calibrated too low, that zone, that zone uh, sorry, the control on that machine is gonna be artificially heating that zone in order to get the temperature back up and it's gonna end up fighting the neighboring zones. So it's really important that all of the zones in any incubator are really tightly calibrated together so to avoid that from happening. If the calibration is correct, does the damper function in test mode? So visually check to make sure that all of the dampers are correctly lined up. As I mentioned at the beginning, we will go into a bit more detail in a moment on damper function. So if you've got a problem with the damper, we'll go into a bit more detail on how to test that. And then you want to be looking at the belt tightness. Are the fans in the machine physically running at the correct RPM? And are they doing the, the, the speed that's expected from them? If not, the usual culprit is the tightness of the belt. Then want to check in the PID settings. These are settings that are hidden away inside the control. Um, and nine times out of 10, they're, they're really difficult to find and they're not needed to be changed. But we have had a couple of instances where customers have gone in playing around testing settings and they forgot to put them back. And that can really throw you off because changing your PID settings is in effect, it's how aggressive the heating and cooling system on your incubator is gonna be. So if you change those settings and forget to put them back whilst you're testing out some new settings, you'll find that one incubator behaves very differently to the others on site. And last of all, the overall integrity of the machine. So specifically the door seals, if your door's not closing correctly, even a small gap at the bottom of the door or around the seal on the edges can lead to a massive increase in airflow through the incubator and that can throw the temperature control off inside the incubator as well, leading to all of the problems that we discussed earlier on with uh, additional heating or surplus heating per zones and an increase in the hatch window as well. So by working your way through these two trees, hopefully you've identified and been able to solve any heating system or any, any fault with the heating system on one of our incubators. So in summary for the heating system, it's important to know what good looks like. Physically, what are your heating elements you have on the machine? What's the expected current draw and what's the expected resistance of each, each of those heating elements? Have that documented in your hatchery. And then when somebody comes up to you with a, a suspected fault on the machine, you know exactly what different what, what to look for that's different to normal. Start with the easy step. All of our controls come with built-in test mode. So it's nice and easy to go in and force that PLC output, which in turn will force the relay, which will then turn on the field device, in this case, the heating elements. So start with what works in which case is the touch screen and then work down the system in order to to get to the the correct the correct component nice and quickly the last thing on this list is to dispose of any faulty hardware this is especially true for any faulty plc or plc inputs and outputs but also for probes and heating elements if it's faulty dispose of it there's absolutely nothing worse than having a fault on the machine picking a picking a component off the shelf to replace a, a faulty bit of hardware with and then finding out that the part on your shelf is faulty as well. And then you're back to square one, never quite sure if you fixed the problem or if you just um, bought another problem into, into the mix. And we're gonna spend the next couple of minutes looking at specifically damper system failures on the machine. And I think it's really worth spending a little bit of time before we go into this, just going into the construction of the damper system and the ventilation system on, on an individual incubator as well. So first thing to note is on vast majority of our incubators, that all of the dampers on the machine are controlled by one single damper motor centrally located. So here you can see it mounted at the front of a hatcher, which has just got uh, a, a single inlet. Uh, it's a single zone setter rather that one. Now that motor is gonna be either 24 volts or 230 volts. All of our recent incubators for the last eight, nine years or so have all been 24 volts, a so low voltage um, DC actuators. You go past that, so upwards to a decade to around 30 years ago, and the damper motors are usually 230 volts, so they're high voltage uh, motors. So it's just bearing in mind when you are ordering spares to make sure that you get the correct one. The damper itself has an additional clip-on module that fits over the top of it. This module is what gives the feedback to the PLC to let us know the position of the damper 
um, so we can control and we, we can display that information on the Maestro system. There's two options for that. We've got potentiometer, which gives us a four to 20 milliamp feedback directly to the PLC, or a switched feedback, which is two digital switches, one for closed and one for open. Um, and on the older controls, especially the Gen 3, what we do is time the difference it takes to get or sorry, time the duration it takes to get between open and closed. And then we divide that by the percentage that we want the damp to get to. So if it takes 20 seconds to get from zero to 100% and we want it at 50%, we'll power that damper for 10 seconds in order to get there. Now running all the way down a larger machine, we'll have a damper connecting rod. This isn't one continuous rod. It's lots of portions of rod about a meter and a half long. They connect one damper to the next one. Now it does this using these little couples on the edge of the damper here with four grub screws in it. This is a cylindrical um, shaft where the damper rod fits in the middle. It's got a small flat beveled edge marked on it and then a hardened steel grub, grub screw fits in there just to hold it in place and make sure it rotates it all at the same time. If at some point in that connection, the grub screw comes loose, what's gonna happen is your damper motor will activate, it'll turn, but it won't continue that motion that activation all the way down the machine. So what you can find is three of your dampers on your machine will work absolutely fine, and then three of them may not. So spotting the issue with the damper. Again, it's vital that this is part of your preset checklist. So it's a, it's a manual function just to go into that test mode, drive that damper all the way open, and then drive it all the way closed, and just a visual check to make sure that all of the dampers on your machine are doing the same thing, doing exactly what you expect. Then you've got a review of your Maestro data. There's one thing in the incubator that will readily and very quickly tell you if something's not right on the ventilation of that incubator, and that's your humidity level. It's the first thing and it's the quickest to respond if something goes either too high or too low on the HVAC of your machine. If you've got a damp on your machine, which is artificially low, so it's lower than what you'd expect, what you'll see is a general upward trend of your humidity level inside the machine. So on this particular graph, the humidity level is in your green, which is standard for our maestro, and you can see the damper position in blue. Now it looks like from this that the damper position is modulating correctly, but we can see that the damper, sorry, the humidity level is slowly creeping up. To me, that's ind indicative of a damper failure that's closed too low. The counterpoint to this would be the humidity level creeping downwards, and again, this would be the opposite of that, where the damper is stuck open and we're overventilating that incubator. As I said, from this, we can still see that it looks like the damper is modulating correctly. The other possible fault, if I go down here a moment, is that your feedback for the damper is stopped working, in which case your humidity level will do whatever it needs to do, but your humidity, your damper feedback is going to either drop to zero or it's going to stay at a static reading. The other thing to look out for on Maestro graphs for heating systems, for, for a damper failure rather, is either artificially high or artificially low heating and cooling in particular zones. So if you're finding zones one and two in your incubator are working absolutely fine and it's as per normal, but zones three and four are doing a load of heating, that would indicate to me either a problem with the sol cooling solenoid or that the damper isn't fully closing when it needs to. So we're ventilating those rear zones of the machine more than the front of the zone. So the heating system's having to work harder in order to compensate for that. So at this point, we're aware that there is a fault with the, with the damper system on the machine. Now we're down to trying to identify that as quickly as possible, ideally without going inside the machine and taking the eggs out, but being fully aware that in order to give us enough time and allow us to do this in a more relaxed manner, we may need to transfer those eggs. So go into test mode straight away, manually drive open and drive close that damper. Does the damper motor physically move? Does it work? So on a Gen 4 monochrome, Gen 4 color or a rock screen, again, you've got all of the functions there to drive the damper open and closed. Uh, if the damper does work, you're then checking each individual damper to make sure all those connecting rods are transitioning that power to turn all the way down the length of the machine. If it doesn't, you want to be checking those damper rods. So check these connections again, just to make sure those grub screws are nice and tight. It is worth noting at this point that on that, on that couple, you can see that there's four grub screws. There's two for each 
damper rod. So even if one of them comes loose, the other one should keep it nice and secure. It's highly recommended that when you're tightening these up and installing them as we do, that you just put a, a little glob of Loctite on those threads just to make sure they're nice and secure. If the dampers do move, so mechanically the damper's functioning absolutely fine, then we're around to checking the settings for that damper. So there's a couple of settings in the machine that are really important to check. The first one is the control philosophy for the damper itself. If you're expecting the damper to control in humidity control, it's got to be in humidity control for it to do that. And it, it may be the case that somebody's gone through and accidentally changed a setting, or they've changed the set the damper to manual just to keep a humidity alarm quiet when they were called out the night before and forgot to put it back into automatic control the next day. So going into this screen and just making sure verifying what the settings are for the control can save you a lot of heartache. The next screen here is the cooling mode for the machine. This is specifically on a Gen 4 incubator, but it carries across to a rock as well in some of the, the newer Gen 3 controls. So here on the screen in the bottom right hand corner, you can see that the cooling mode for the machine is water then air. So what this means is the control is going to first of all try cooling the machine if it's above temperature using the solenoid and the chilled water. And if that doesn't bring the temperature down within a reasonable time, so three or four seconds, it's then going to start opening up the damper to bring additional cooling in in terms of uh, fresh air into the incubator. By doing this, the damper on that machine is in temperature control. So you are not able to have this setting for your cooling mode on the machine as well as humidity control for your damper, because we'd then be trying to control the damper on both humidity and temperature. Now, if you've got a maestro system that you're using to send stage programs, it will flag this conflict in control philosophies up for you and not allow you to send those settings to the machine. It'll inform you exactly why, so you can modify those. The very last settings to look for on the for the damper are your are these three interlocks here. These dictate how that damper is going to behave under, under three separate alarm conditions. The one on the left be a fan fail alarm. We always recommend that one's enabled. So if your main fan fails, we get that damper open nice and quickly, get some fresh air through the machine and make sure the cabinet's kept nice and cool. The second one's a high temperature alarm, which works on the mercury free over temperature or the independent over temperature alarm. And the very last one is a high humidity alarm. And it's personal preference on those last two, whether you want them open or not. Bulk of our incubators for the last 10 years or so are sold with a break glass system as well, especially on the hatches. So if that over temp does, does activate, we'd cool the machine down by any means necessary. Now back to the test mode. If you're hitting that test mode and the, the damper physically doesn't work, so it doesn't move, we're then back to checking the PLC outputs. So on a Gen 3 control, again, you've got the little LED lights at the top of the digital output card. So we're checking whether they're active, putting a multimeter across the output and just checking for that 24 volts. And on a Gen 4 incubator, again, the digital outputs are that bottom row of lights and the digital inputs are the top row of lights. If the output, outputs don't activate, we're going to first of all try to reload the PLC using our on-site memory cassette. And if that doesn't work, we're going to replace the PLC. If the outputs do work, then we're going to check that 24 volt just to make sure it's supplying the relays and then check the relays to see if they're supplying the required either 240 volt or the 24 volt out to the damper. Now, depending on the control, your dampers are going to require different signals from the PLC. So for Gen 3 and some older Gen 4 controls, we had two relays output to the damper. So it's usually relays three and four. Relay three would be to force open the damper. Relay three and four in conjunction would be to close the damper. So is the PLC supplying 204, uh, sorry, 24 volts to the relay? If not, you wanna check the power supply and replace it as required. And if it is, you wanna then be looking at the relay itself and or the base. Now the relay is the most common problem. Nine times out of 10, when you're looking at a, re a relay fault, it's the relay itself that's causing the problem. But whilst you're, whilst you're in there interrogating the relay, it's always worth taking a look at the base of the relay itself, checking for heat damage that could be caused by arcing from a loose cable or overcurrent, and just keeping an eye on that as well, because that could also be the fault. And if they do deteriorate over time, and our, our incubators are expected to last for 20, 30 years, relay bases aren't. So it's worth keeping an eye on them just to make sure that they're kept in tip top condition and replaced as soon as they show signs of deterioration. 
Now back to the relays. Are they supplying the 240 or 24 volt out to the relay? If they are, we want to get that we want to get that replaced as soon as possible. So get that damper physically removed, put a fresh one in its place and just verify again that with that, with that control voltage that it moves or not. So first of all, again, you've got to know your system. You've got to know what damper you physically have on each of your machines. And if, you, if you're in a hatchery that's been expanded over the years, it may be that you've got mains voltage dampers on your older equipment and 24 volt dampers on your newer equipment. Knowing that is going to help you identify exactly what that incubator needs and what it's going to have to have in order for that damper to, to actuate. Carry out regular checks on your machine. Those preset checklists are an absolute godsend in order to identify early problems of your incubator. It's also a great way of teaching newer staff, newer maintenance staff or newer operators in your hatchery on the basic functions of your machine because it forces them to go into those test screens, look around the incubator, see it working in a good, clean environment with no stress on them. And then they, when there is a problem, it's not, it's not this scary control system that they've suddenly got to learn and troubleshoot at the same time. And then as with all of the previous ones, we're going to start with the basic functions on the machine. So we're going to go into those test modes, force the outputs, see what activates, and then work our way down through that tree in order to, to get to the faulty component. So the next one we're going to spend a little bit of time on is turning faults in the incubators. Again, I'm not going to spend a great deal of time going into the into finite detail on exactly what our turning systems are and how they're constructed. We did do a previous webinar specifically on turning systems. And again, I highly recommend anybody that wants more information on that to check out the webinars on demand on our website where there's a, a lot more information. So the first step is to know your turning system. The bulk of the incubators that we're shipping out of the door now come in, in one of three flavors. We've got the bottom turning system, which you can see here which interfaces onto the bottom of the trolley through the turning shoe and the yoke. Now this is a pneumatic turning system, which on a Gen 4 system, on a Gen 4 incubator has got three limit switches on that centrally mounted actuator. That tells us the position of the actuator, whether it's extended, retracted, or in the level position. This same turning system on a rock control it's got an inclinometer built into it. So that gives us a real time read back of exactly what the turn angle is of that turning system in the trolleys without any magnetic switches in the system. Our top turning system, which has been a staple for the last two decades or so, this is where you've got a roof mounted actuator through a turning shoe in the side of the machine, which then interfaces to a turning shoe on the top of the trolley. Very reliable system, and again, it works on three reed switches or three magnetic switches on the actuator to tell us when the when the, that system is either fully extended, fully retracted, or in the level position. We've also got the classic machine, obviously, which has got a slightly different turning system in it, or a very different turning system in it, which is one single rotary mechanical motor centrally mounted, and it transfers that rotary motion into an angular motion through the Pitman bar inside the machine. Again, for considerably more in-depth delve into these turning systems, I highly recommend you, you visit our previous webinar that we've done. It's worth mentioning whilst we're here, the two other turning systems that we have done over the years, it's on trolley turnings for our SS machines, which is a 230 volt actuator bottom mounted onto each individual trolley and a pneumatic top turning system, which was uh, predominantly on Buckeye machines of around 20, 30 years ago. 20, 30 years ago. As I said, for more details, see our webinars on demand where we, where we did do a deep delve into turning systems a couple of months ago. So spot on the issue, again, preset checklists. For turning systems, it's almost more important than everything else to carry out regular preventative maintenance and do these carry out these checks. A deterioration in turn, turn angle is not usually something that's gonna be fine one day and then be a problem the next day. It's going to be a slow degradation in turn angle over 10, 20 years lifespan of an incubator. Um, and at some point on that, on that degradation, it's going to start impacting your chick quality. But it's not going to be suddenly you wake up one day and your chicks are, are not what you expect. It's going to be a gradual decline. By monitoring this, it allows you to forecast that degradation and plan maintenance in at times when it's convenient to you and not when you're trying to get chicks out the door, fill more chicks in the machine, but you know you've got this problem to fix at the same time. So regularly taking the, the turn angles of your individual trolleys in the individual machines and documenting them is a great way of spotting that. 
If you're fortunate enough to have windows in your setters, a good way of spotting a problem in your machine is by looking through the tops of the trolleys. And what you're looking for here is for the heights of those hanger bars to be nice and level across the full length of the machine. If you're seeing one that's dropped down a little bit low, it's a little bit high, that's a pretty good indicator that something's gone awry in that machine, either a mechanical jams not allowing it to turn fully, or the trolley may just not be in this correct location and interface with the turning system correctly. For mechanical wear on the machine, you're gonna have you you're gonna have an amount of mechanical wear. If you don't rectify it before it becomes a problem, these are the sort of symptoms that you can see where the hanger bar is physically worn through. Now this hanger bar needs to be replaced. However, up until that, this trolley is not going to be maintaining that 38 degrees minimum that we look for. Ideally, we want to be hitting 45 degrees on every single leg in that incubator. But with hanger bars like this not being maintained, that's simply not going to be possible. By carrying out regular checks as well, it's not just inside the machine you want to be looking for. Especially on top turning systems, we've got this link bar that goes the full length of the machine. If you have a mechanical jam inside the machine, what can happen is this link bar becomes deformed. This needs to be replaced. What will happen when this is replaced is a, it, puts too, uh, it puts excessive stress on the rest of the turning mechanism on the machine, and also it compromises the turn angles down the length of the machine. So there's portions of this turn, turning bar that are now going to be shorter than they're meant to be from point to point on those individual trolleys. As a result, you're going to lose turn angle and lose actuation. Worst case, that bar snaps completely or bends completely and you get a mechanical jam on not only this incubator, but the one next to it as well. Worst case, if, you, if your hatchability drops below around 30, sorry, if your turning angles drop below around 38 degrees, left and right, you're going to see a noticeable drop in your chick quality and hatchability, um, not only because the, the development of the embryo with inside the egg, but also because of the impact on airflow within the cabinet. The turning is, or sorry, the airflow within the cabinet is designed around the trolleys turning to their optimum angle of around 34, 35 degrees, and anything below that will have an impact on it. So again, the first thing we're going to do is go into the test mode. Once we're in the test mode, we're going to manually drive those that, that turning system all the way open to all the way fully extended and all the way fully retracted again, retracted again. And we're going to check whether or not that turning system physically moves. Now, it doesn't matter which type of turning system you have. All of our controls allow you to do this on the touch screen. So we've got an Avida, we've got the multi-stage machine here, we've got the on trolley turning, and then we're back to the Avida again. So if it doesn't physically move, Again, we're back to checking for the PLC outputs. What's the first thing that should be happening in this in this chain? And it's the PLC outputs. So we're going to check those for that 24 volts and make sure that it, it make sure that that's going out to the relays and then out to the actuators. If the PLC outputs aren't activating, and this is specifically for top turning customers, whether you've got the SKF actuator or the Warner actuator, you want to be checking the thermal switches. Now your thermal switches are in line with the power going out to the actuator. So if your thermal switches are active, the PLC will physically not allow you to power up those actuators because there's a catastrophic fault being registered within that actuator. Now these are paired up. So if you've got a 24 trolley actuator, uh, 24 trolley machine that's with four actuators on them, one at the front left, one at the front right, and then two more at the rear of the machine, they're gonna be in pairs. So if you have one of them that's overheating, it's going to stop the second actuator in that pair from powering up as well. So you want to check those thermal switches. If the thermal switches are good, you then want to be checking the PLC configuration, just to be absolutely sure nobody's gone in and accidentally changed a setting in, the, in that configuration. If the PL PLC configuration is correct, you want to reload the PLC and then replace the PLC as an absolute last stand. If your PLC outputs do activate, are they activating the relays? Is the relay receiving the 24 volts? If it's not, you're back to checking the power supply on the PLC and replacing it as needed. And if it does receive those 24 volts, does the relay then give 230 volt or 24 volt in terms of the pneumatic actuators? Does it give that high voltage signal out to the actuators? If not, you replace the relays. If it is, then you're down to replacing either the turning actuator or the solenoid in case of the bottom turning pneumatic system. Now in test mode, if the turning system does move in test mode, 
the obvious question becomes when it is in automatic, are you physically seeing those limit switches? So by limit switches, what I mean is on this screen, they should light up. So when those magnetic switches are being seen by the control, it'll close the circuit and it'll show the icon on the screen. So you fully extend the, the actuator, are they seen? And then you gradually bring that back. And as it moves, the, the limit switches for level and then fully retracted will light up on the screen. If you're not seeing them in automatic, the next question becomes, are you seeing them in test mode? If you're not, you wanna replace the limit switches. So the limit switches are, are faulty or they're not wired up correctly to the control. If you are able to see the limit switches in test mode, but you can't see them when you're in automatic, you wanna adjust those limit switches, especially when you've got a machine which has got 10, 20 years of wear and tear on it and the hanger bars are snapped through, the trolleys are a little bit deformed because they haven't been maintained. Uh, what usually happens is as the turn angles decrease, the guys on site will push those limit switches further to the extents of the actuator, which makes it harder for the system to turn those turn that egg mass. As it gets harder and harder for the system to turn the egg mass, it'll get to the limit switches and then bounce back off the limit switch by a fraction of a millimeter, but it's just enough to not fully activate that limit switch. In those cases, in order to stop a turn alarm and to have the system run normally, you need to bring those limit switches in by a millimeter or two. So that's a really small grub screw just to loosen the restraining bolt, bring them in a little bit, and then you should be good to go again. But if that's the case, the chances are your maintenance on your, on your turning system as a whole needs to be refreshed in order to bring your turn, an turn angles back to what you expect. Now, if your limit switches are being seen in automatic, so your system is physically functioning absolutely fine, it's moving and it's seeing the limit switches, we wanna check the settings of that system. Now, the most important setting on this screen is the one spot in the middle, just next underneath that alarm icon. This is what we call the watchdog timer. Now, the watchdog timer is the amount of time that we give the control in order to get from one location to another. So if the, if the turning system is fully extended and we want it to retract, and that time is set to 20 seconds for sake of argument, and it takes 22 seconds to get to that location, it's gonna raise an alarm. So it's worth checking those settings just to be absolutely sure that you're giving yourself enough time to avoid nuisance alarms. Equally, if you've got that, that set to 45 seconds and you're still not able to make that full turn in that time, chances are your actuator on the machine is about to break and it's right on the end of its life cycle, or on case of pneumatic systems, it might be that you need to upsize your compressor or check the pressure release valve going into the machine or the pressure regulator going into the machine just to make sure that your pneumatic pressure is sufficient to drive the actuator. So summary again, you need to know your turning system. You need to be absolutely familiar with what hardware you have on your machine and be comfortable with using it. You've got to carry out regular checks on your system. So doing those preset checklists and preventative maintenance, recording your turn angles and, and as in recording the degradation of those turn angles over time is absolutely vital to be able to forecast the breakdown. Turning systems is one of the few systems on, a, on an incubator that we know within 20 years is gonna deteriorate, but there are clear and simple steps that you can take. Our newer trolleys, for instance, come with Igor bushes, so nylon bushes in all of the mechanical wear points, which makes uh, preventative maintenance far easier because instead of replacing mechanical and metal components in your trolleys in your machines you just pop those bushings out and replace them with a, a very cheap alternative when you are going through the test functions you need to start with the basics so start with what you know works which is from the test mode and then work your way down the system to narrow it down once you've finished with the test system and you, sorry, once you've finished with the turning system and you've got the system back up and running again, you wanna carry out a visual check. Like I said with the link bar, the system might physically work, but you're putting additional stress on the system. So when you have fixed it, make sure that the incubator is in a good state and that you're happy for it to run for another year in that state. Turning systems have a lot of stress and a lot of torque going through them. If everything's not perfectly aligned and set up correctly, it can lead to a lot further, a, a lot more structural damage to the incubator, which is going to be a lot more expensive to fix down the line. So the last one, the last uh, fault finding guide that we're going to spend a little, little bit of time on today is for probe failures in the machine. This is intentionally kept fairly vague. Um, and fairly broad speaking to cover all of the possible probes in our machine. 
So the different types of probes that we're going to have in our machine. Obviously, we've got temperature probes on our different controls. These are by and large RTD. So they're PT100 probes that change their resistance based on the temperature of the, of the ambient air. And then we transfer that signal, uh, add or subtract the calibration value, and then display that on the screen. We've got humidity, which has got a choice between wet bulb, which is the same as a PT100, usually seen on hatches, or you've got your RH sensor. So it's a relative humidity sensor that gives us a zero to 10 volt signal straight back into the PLC. And then we've got CO2, anemometer, which can give us our airflow into the incubator, and then damper feedbacks are pot a potential as well. Of all of those sensors I've just mentioned, they're largely split into three main groups. RTD is by arguably the, the most important one inside the, inside the machine. So this is a resistance thermal probe. And as I said, as the temperature of the probe differs, it will change the resistance of that. So we put a voltage through it, we see the resistance drop of that, and that gives us very accurately a temperature reading. Now voltage sensors are exactly what it says on the tin. So it's a zero to 10 or a zero to five volt in case of our CO2 sensors signal back to the PLC. And we scale that based on what we wanna see on the screen. And then we've got a, a, a small section of our inputs, which is mainly the field device, sorry, the damper feedback, which is a current feedback, so four to 20 milliamp. Now knowing this is important, because the PLC inputs need to be configured for the sensor type that's going to be wired into them. So here we can see on the left hand side an analog card and just there it tells you that we're expecting a voltage input into that into that card. So you can't just simply swap that that sensor with a another one unless it's got a comparable sensor scaling and feedback. Now on the bottom of these drawings just here we handily put on all of our control panel drawings exactly what the configuration of those cards needs to be in order to take that signal. So if either of these two things are, are, calib are commissioned wrong or calibrated wrong, what you're going to find is that that isn't going to show the correct value on your screen. So if the PLC control is expecting a current input, but we've got a voltage sensor in there, the, the value that displays on screen is going to be of, of no consequence. It's not going to make any sense compared to reality. So knowing that is the first step in, in succeeding in these cases. <clears throat> We're going to take a slightly different route in order to fault find on probes. The main reason for this is because probes have got far fewer mechanical uh, components um, in, their, in their functionality. So there's far fewer things that can go wrong. And it's one of the few items on the machine that you absolutely want to get back up and running as quickly and effectively as possible. So the first thing I'd say is if you suspect a fault with a field device on your machine, is check the calibration of that. So you go and check the calibration and make sure that the viewing on the screen is accurate compared to what your calibration box is showing you. Now it's worth noting at that point, you've got to make sure your calibration box is also accurate. So make sure that that's calibrated by an external company on a periodic basis and all of your hatchery staff that are using it know how to effectively use it. First thing we're going to do is check the power supply, especially for things like um, humidity sensors, CO2 sensors, anything that relies on the voltage feedback to the PLC. If you have a fluctuation in your power supply reading, that will directly impact the voltage that's being seen from your sensors. So if you set up all of your machines and you calibrate all of your humidity sensors on your machine and your power supply is giving out 24 volts, a nice steady 24 volts, and then a year later, that same power supply is supplying 23.5 volts, your humidity sensor is gonna be off by a small amount. So checking that calibration, documenting what it's gonna be, what your power supply is meant to be, um, and then documenting that in the hatchery so everybody knows what it is, is absolutely vital. Next thing you wanna do is check the voltage coming into the PLC. So as I said, for a humidity sensor, nice and easy one. If you're seeing 6.8 volts into your PLC, your screen, ignoring any calibration, should be 68% humidity. If that's not what you're seeing, either there's a calibration offset in there for that value or your input module is faulty. So straight away, you can narrow down the fault in that circuit to being either the, the humidity probe or the input module. So when you say measuring the, the voltage, what we're checking across is these two terminals here. So you've got your signal or your out terminal from the, from the 
R8 sensor in this case, compared to your zero volts. Now, once you've done that, we're going to move on to a little bit more complicated, a little bit more involved in the control. So here we can see, obviously not in a, inside a machine, but you've got a PT100 probe wired up to an RTD module. What we'd want to do is try a new probe. So you can do this without taking exits out of the machine, and it'll only take a couple of minutes. Unwire one probe and stick another one in its location. Does the value on screen then revert to displaying a correct value or one that you'd expect? An easier check, if you've got a multi-zone machine, and especially on HVAC units, is to take the wiring for that probe and move it to a separate input that's configured for the same input. And does the, does the problem with that probe follow the wiring or does it stay on the card? Again, it's a really good way of quickly identifying whether the probe's at fault or whether it's the, anal uh, the analog input module or the RTD input module. Once we've done that, we're gonna go ahead and replace the module. Modules on the control systems of Chipmaster incubators are by their very nature, reasonably expensive modules. When you look at the incubator as a whole, they're one of the single most expensive components on that machine. And that's for a reason. We use controls that are built for industrial automation. It's built to last for 20 years. However, some components do on occasion fail. Despite the cost of these modules, they're still far cheaper than losing an incubator full of eggs. So if you've ever got any doubts on the control system on an incubator, first recommendation is always to preserve the integrity of the eggs in the incubation cycle, swap out the module of the known good one and get that incubator running. And then once the incubator is empty and you've got time for preventative maintenance, that faulty module can then be properly diagnosed and find out exactly what the problem is. That is the end of today's presentation. I hope it's uh, given some good information to everybody. Um, it's a little bit more of an insight as to exactly how Chipmaster engineers go about fault finding and troubleshooting our incubators. Thank you again. Hopefully you, ha hopefully you all have a great festive period at the end of December. And we look forward to seeing you all again in 2021.